Hello, Working Preachers. This is Joy J. Moore, and I'm excited to announce that we are kicking off our spring fundraising campaign tomorrow. After you make any gift to the spring campaign during the month of May, we will send you a link to access additional Sermon Brainwave content. This includes presentations by the Sermon Brainwave team, along with some of your other favorite Working Preacher contributors at this year's Festival of Homiletics. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you. And we're so grateful for each and every one of you. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And uh, this is uh, the podcast where we now move uh, to Romans for a few weeks. So the, the logic in the Narrative Lectionary in Easter is uh, a little bit of the story from Acts. And then uh, in each year, a different uh, moving to a different one of Paul's letters. Last week, we had Paul and Barnabas set aside and sent out in their, um, their calling to be the apostles to the Gentiles. And so now you see, uh, and we had the story of, of them arriving at Lystra, but now you see the end of that story really in this year of the narrative lectionary, because uh, Paul writes to the, his letter to the Romans. And of the letters of Paul that we have, this is the only letter uh, that we know of that he is sending to a church he didn't found and that he hadn't reached yet when he wrote this letter. And um, it is a letter then, he knows a lot of the people that are there, right? There are Roman roads, there are, there's the Mediterranean Sea, people got around, but he's writing with, with a certain amount of urgency um, to clarify some things about the gospel uh, as he is preaching it. And there's so much packed into these first um, 17 verses that really, uh, you know, you could just spend an entire Bible study on the first six verses. So maybe we should even just talk a little bit about that, although we do have to get to the end. These first verses, right? Paul, a servant slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Spirit. Maybe we should just stop with each one of those points. Uh, what do you have to throw uh, into uh, into the hopper for this week? A slave or a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. I mean, that right there is a big claim. It's a huge claim. I'll jump in. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about um, um, how things get lost in translation. And um, we can spend a lot of time talking about this term servant or slave and uh, spend a lot of time uh, kind of arguing through that language. Uh, and I, I think that something much bigger is being communicated here. And we would be missing the mark if what we spend time doing is saying, you know, well, it looks like this language isn't uh, deconstructing the class and caste system of Roman uh, and Greek culture. And uh, once we get through this letter, we will recognize that as Paul has done in, in, in other letters, uh, Paul very much is undermining the caste and class system. But he's using language of that context. And uh, I, I think one of the things as we're talking about this, we don't want to get um, uh, weighed down in our understandings of the term. Uh, so that we can't get to the bigger um, um, claims that are being made here. Yeah, no, I think that's really wise. And one of the things that's important to know about Romans, and as Rolf introduced it, it could be helpful to talk with your congregation about the difference between the center and the periphery, geographically speaking. So imagine and I will say this as somebody from Los Angeles, 
if somebody from Minnesota were to appear in Los Angeles, and the idea of one being a cultural center and one being thought of within the context of the culture as quote unquote flyover country. This idea that there is different weight given to different places. And Paul, as we talked about in Acts for last week, Paul is somebody from the periphery, from the back country. He is from Asia Minor, which is this kind of minor part of the empire, literally. <laughs> that and then comes to right right to the center of things and as joy pointed out he does it with big language he does not despite the fact of where he's from mince words in describing who he is and why it's so important that he's writing but i think it's important that he's doing so to get across how important this message that he's trying to uh, portray to the Romans is that urgency that you spoke mm -hmm. of and it answers you know this is an ancient letter and one of the things in ancient letters is the opening of the letter answers the important question who is this person and why do we care and Paul names himself in this with two very important terms first of all as we said a servant of Jesus Christ Again, writing to other followers of Jesus Christ, identifying with them, uh, also identifying who he is not a servant of, which gets to your point, Joy, in terms of this is Rome, this is where the emperor lives, this is Caesar's house. And also, the second thing about him is he is called to be an apostle. And you said that was a big claim, Joy. Did you say a little bit more about why that's a big claim? Well, this good news, and we're going to get get to it as we move through uh, the rest of, of this portion um, of, of the pericope, um, this um, powerful good news of God um, is setting a trajectory that is countercultural, um, as you said, who he is not a servant of, who is not Lord for him. Um, but how is this good news? How does this become the power of God for salvation? What do we mean by that statement? Uh, how do we understand that this is good to hear, especially if you hear it in the context that this is going to be disruptive to the existing culture? And as you said, this culture is the center uh, this isn't flyover country. This isn't a minor context. And yet, in this disruption, this is going to be the most powerful, the best news ever. And that is that the God who has been proclaimed by the small people of Israel actually is keeping a faithful promise to bring life and abundant life to everybody. And that was the message of Jesus Christ. You may have heard about him. Wow, you've got my attention. Exactly. It, uh, I it had mine, myself. It, oh, go for it. I had myself uh, muted there a minute ago, mostly because uh, my cat, Bandit the Podcat, is making a nuisance of himself <laughs> a little bit in the room here. But um, what I wanted to say yeah. about this is that. Um, what Paul then goes on to say as he continues to describe himself is really that the, the most important thing about himself is not about himself. It's about Jesus and who Jesus is. And so he has this long narrated, you know, um, Jesus Christ set aside. I mean, well, Paul set aside, but, you know, and then he goes, right. He, he goes on and on in a, about the gospel unpacking it, but then I want to go skirt to the end of this passage because um, uh, we go through verse 17 and um, he says this in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's everybody for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. So honor and shame language, I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
Uh, I know what this looks like in the Old Testament honor and shame, uh, but Christopher, maybe what does honor and shame look like in Rome? I think the best way that we can think about honor and shame in terms of the Roman Empire is to look at, and I, this is a great connection, to look at the cross. Right. Because when we talk at, about honor and shame, honor, of course, being the positive of the two of these and shame being the negative, the cross and crucifixion was intended to be the most shameful thing that could happen to a person. They stripped all your clothes off. They beat you in public. They nailed you to a cross and they hung you up so that everybody who walked by could watch you die. And this is shame. This is showing that the empire treats you as a non-person, that they can do this to you. And so in this context, Paul says that thing, that thing that every is supposed to bring the absolute most shame upon a person that could be. I am not ashamed of this. And I think if you if you keep this shame language with the cross in mind, that's when it becomes really powerful. That this thing, in fact, it is through this shameful thing that God does the work that God is doing in the world. And what's incredibly disruptive about that is multiplied in the fact Rolf, when you read it, you sort of said, this is everybody, Jews and to the Greeks. But that's huge. You know, it's like, yeah, there's this little people, this tribe of Israel, they believe this God, you know. And wait a minute, you're saying that what they have to offer is really good and it's for everyone? I need to know the rest of this story because that is the story from Genesis 12 to the arrival of Jesus. It's this promise for the sake of everybody else told from the position of Jews. And then the Jews get it with the resurrection of Jesus. And when they're no longer ashamed, then everybody else is now an inheritor. And that's good news.